Today's guest is Daniel Mate. Daniel Mate is an award-winning composer, lyricist, and playwright for musical theater with an MFA in musical theater writing from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts and a BA in psychology and philosophy from McGill. He co-authored the New York Times bestselling book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture with his father, Dr. Gabor Mate. The two Mate's next book will be called Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Parents and Their Adult Children, based on their popular workshop of the same title. Daniel runs the world's only mental chiropractic service, Take a Walk with Daniel. Welcome, Daniel. Lovely to have you on the show. Thank you, Hadar. It's a great pleasure to be in your web. So one of the first questions I like to ask my guests, because part of the podcast is really about weaving relationships and connections and community. Yeah. So how do you know me? <laughs> how, how did you come into my web? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What lured me into your web? Well, it was, um, you know, it was our respective activism since October 7th. Now, of course, you've been, it turns out, doing activism in this space, Israel-Palestine, for a lot longer than me. Um, it, at least being vocally and publicly, you know, uh, out here advocating for um, for justice and peace and all that, I, uh, you know, I can get into my story of of where I first connected with the topic, but I, you know, you you've been connected with it from birth. But October seventh, of course, brought a lot of us who had been silent or kind of on the sidelines um, onto the field of speaking about it. So Instagram. Um, was where we met, um, and there was a group of eight of us, I guess you could group us as anti-Zionist Jews, who are speaking out for a ceasefire against the occupation, against the siege, and for a free Palestine, who had developed some followings, and we had both been invited to take part in a Hanukkah event. It's kind of nice that there was eight of us and eight nights of Hanukkah. It was going to be an online Zoom event in December. And um, yeah, we got put in the same cohort. It was quite an honored group. And uh, so I took an interest in every single person, most, most of whom I didn't know, and um, immediately got interested in your work. I saw your video on the Syrian tradition of the Syrian Jewish tradition of lighting an extra candle um, in gratitude for the hospitality and connection between um, Syria and its Jews. And they, immediately I was like, oh, being in touch with this person is going to teach me a lot of things that I need to know, which are just part of the blind spots of me being a North American born European derived white Jew, for lack of a better word, an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, so that was really cool. But what was even better was that, you know, you and I started just chatting on, on, on the DMs and pretty quickly realized that I was going to be in LA physically um, during the week of Hanukkah, I was there to lead uh, the Hello Again workshop with my father. And we kind of just instinctively were like, well, why don't we host something in person? You know, I hadn't been in a room with anybody. I'd been out to a couple of protests, but I'm not really a protest guy. But the thought of getting people in a room, in a space, and just seeing what happened, especially Jews and Palestinians and whoever else wanted to come, and you were totally up for it. And since you have such a community there, it was like you were the perfect co-organizer. So we just put this thing together without ever having met. And I, that was the first night I met you. It was December 12th. And um, we had a really good turnout, like 30 people. And um, I thought that the organizing had gone really smoothly, uh, smoothly up to that point, but I didn't know what it was going to be like. And I kind of handed it over to you to sort of lead because you had some ideas about how to what to, what to say and what to, how to lead it. And you just launched right into this beautiful... Um, introductory exercise after we let people mill about a bit and have some of the catered Lebanese food and all that. Um, this listening exercise that was really deep and uh, went to all these surprising places, you know, and it reminded me, it was, it was uncanny, actually. Uh, I don't know if I've said this to you, but it's like, I felt like I was back in my lefty Zionist summer camp Madrid days when I was a summer camp counselor. Oh, wow. So you I know, brought you back to Zionism. You brought me back to the best <laughs> the best parts of my Zionist education. And there were many great parts. It wasn't all, you know, rah, 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 hatikva all day, all night. 
there was a lot of community and a lot of ritual and a lot of thoughtful education on outside the box topics and a lot of attention to the quality of the space and the quality of the conversation and a lot of consensus building and a lot of connection between people from different age groups and all this kind of stuff. And just, just, you know, as they say in Hebrew, you know, the, 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 the sense of community and, and, um, and fellowship and, and friendship. So here you were leading this exercise for people and um, it was basically, if I remember correctly, it was like people paired up and had a partner and they took turns. And so the first person asks the second person basically kind of how they're doing yeah. since October 7th. With their deeper emotions and the heart. Stuff. That's right. But it started on the identity level. Yeah. That was what was really interesting. And I think yeah. when you said that, I remember being like a bit like, uh oh, is this going to just be all about identity? Because identity is important, but I've, I've noticed how we can often get stuck at that level sure. and identity can create attachments to ideas about ourselves and stories and whatever. So I, I, I was a little bit like, where's this going? But immediately you were like, and how is your identity affecting your experience of this moment? Well, part of what is interesting when building community spaces, especially when they are political, um, we have to be very mindful mm -hmm. of the identities that people are carrying because oftentimes the identity, you know, in, in Judaism, we say that the soul is the essence and the body is the kli, is the vessel, mm. right? And then the 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 clothing is called the levush, um, but that can be seen as the identity, Yeah. right? The identity is a sort of levush, is a certain clothing that we wear over the vessel, which mm -hmm. really guides us into the soul. So it actually, it was kind of an exercise that really went through those um, portals. Outside in. Yeah, because, you know, it, you can't really just um, bypass the identity conversation because I feel, you know, and I think that's what I'm so grateful for a lot of your work and speaking up for Palestine, you know, in the more trauma healing psychology space, because oftentimes in those spaces, people get really sucked into um, the conversation about healing and then they get too afraid to talk about any justice issues because of the identity. Sure, stuff, of course. Right, and 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 I think part of the um, holding on and grasping onto the identity conversation is in response, in some ways, to that. Maybe an overcorrection. Yeah. Yeah. And then what happens is we treat the identity almost as if it lives at the soul level, like right. that's who you are. In my understanding of spirituality, which mostly has been through avenues other than Judaism, just begin again because of the sort of jewish ambivalent uh upbringing i had you know in buddhism you know any attachments to an idea about the self is the impediment to self sure and um so anyway i've always been a bit uncomfortable with the identity conversation yeah but you really masterfully and very elegantly i thought led us through something that any of us no matter where we were starting from could identify with and i think and, and what was cool is that we got to demonstrate the exercise in front of everybody and you asked me about my identity and i had to actually own that oh yeah uh I'm a white Jewish Canadian who lives in New York and has an attitude about Canada. And like, I actually was like, I actually discovered you were Ashkenazi. I discovered <laughs> I was Ashkenazi. Yeah. <laughs> Newsflash. Um, and, and just, just kind of inventorying who I take myself to be and, and yeah. where I take my cues from in terms of how I show up. And just to admit that and own that felt good. And then the question, and how is that affecting your, um, experience of this moment. Well, a big part of the identity that occurred to me actually in that conversation that I think I'd been downplaying is, yeah, I'm a former Zionist youth leader and I miss those days. And then the next question was, uh, and, and how's that, the emotional experience of that? And I had to get in touch with like deep sadness and then some anger. Yeah. And to be in front of the entire room with you like hold, holding space for me and being like, yeah, it pisses me off. Like, yeah. The Jewish world right now is alienating and I feel lonely and angry. And all of a sudden the room is murmuring like, yeah, basically a giant 30 person me too, buddy, yeah. you know, which felt really cool. So, and then I got a chance to like, you know, we switched roles and I did that for you. It was, it was a really cool thing. And then just to watch the entire room and then, you know, the oxygen changed in the room, the, the air kind of the molecules ionized in a different way. Well, that's transformation. That right? is transformation. Like the yeah. same space, but all of a sudden it feels different. Yeah. Because something has happened. Yeah. And I've always loved um, transformational processes and conversations. Yeah. I had just never seen one quite like this. And the fact that it was coming 
from an explicitly Jewish perspective and not just Jewish with no political analysis, but Jewish with a very specific justice-oriented view of the world and being able to have transformation in that space, I was like, mm, this is someone and I have to pay attention to. And with politicians in... We can't do it just in our isolated containers, right? That That's was the powerful thing. There were Palestinians in the room. Totally. Well, so, you know, and I think that's part of what, after that moment, um, we realized that there's a lot of uh, collaborations that can be made possible because you also develop your own curriculum and your own ways of um, helping people navigate moments where they get unstuck through yeah. your mental chiropractic. Yeah. And I've been doing, you know, this emotional energetic. And I think just that fusion has led us to carve out some offerings, which are upcoming. Um, and, and yeah, and, and to really kind of offer containers for people in this time. Yeah. I'm really excited about those because it will be a chance to see what our two modalities do next to each other. I think what's interesting is you do focus on the somatic, energetic, and emotional, but in so doing, you have to deal with the mind. Yeah. And you're very, very skilled at the ways that the mind is implicated in those things and affected by those things and in some ways identical. But you just it's like you're looking at the sphere from one side and I turn it around and I'm looking at the way the mind constructs reality and its internal logic and the ways that people get stuck inside of mental stories and all kinds of stuff and in so doing the body i mean i do it literally by walking with people so right. I, I need the body involved I, in fact i just had someone book someone in egypt is booking a walk with me and they were like yeah i'll just be sitting at home because it's like actually not safe for me to go out and talk about this stuff in public you know yeah. and i was like well that's not going to work you have to we have to get creative and find a place for you to walk yeah because walk in the home either walk in the home or walk in in some park outside of town or whatever it is, you know, because the movement somehow gets the hemispheres going. And then, of course, we're talking about cognitive mental things, but the emotions always kick in in these conversations yeah. because you're unsticking things that have been keeping emotions kind of frozen in amber. Um, yeah, so I want to get more into your mental chiropractic work. Should we talk about the, the collaborations themselves? Should name them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're doing, let's see, as of this recording, next week uh, on February 29th, we're doing a Q&A for people, which is just sort of a come one, come all. And for us also, it's a kind of like, what happens when we put these two approaches together, these, yeah. and these two people together, these two personalities? And I guess one thing I also just want to name is that I think one area that we saw the reason for the alignment of the collaboration is both of our ways of doing transformative work really bring in the self yes and the power within the self yes right because so often we look at the world and we want to change it yep. and we want to change these very very big systems that in some ways feel beyond us yeah and oftentimes we feel powerless in changing them because we're like well what do i as a human how can i change this massive system um and because within the system in some ways we are powerless right of course um and i think that you know this is for me comes from a spiritual perspective that actually right god is everywhere so just as god is outside god is also inside um but also i i think that the more that we kind of get carried away with power being outside of us the more that we abandon and betray our own self for sure and then we get more depleted and then we get stuck in like blame narrative and psychological, yep. all of these different things that, you know, me and you have talked about a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think something that I, I feel um, grateful that we have resonance over is that, oh, actually, there's something about working with our own inner selves and with our own psychology, with our own minds, with our own emotions, with our own ways of being that actually does change reality itself that's and right. it changes reality by first changing our reality right yeah we, we say in, in the myth of normal and this is my dad's little observation you know the buddha said that with our minds we create the world right well first the world creates our minds yes you know but then it's true that all the time we're we're our our, our words are creating our world yes and our perceptions are creating our world and um I like that as, as well about what, what your your work and my work have in common. But what we're not doing is a kind of like, okay, just close your eyes and imagine a parking spot and you're going to manifest it. Like it's not, it's not simply about like granting wishes 
-hmm. It's about taking a look at where do I experience limitation? Where do I experience constraint? Where do I experience um, being cut off from whether you call it source or God or self or flow or whatever you want to call it? And then asking, okay, let's say external reality did not change. Let's say everything was exactly like this forever. How free can I be right, right now yeah. in that? And what would it take? What would I need to let go of? What would I need to face? What would I need to experience? What in me would need to be seen or heard by someone else? You know, and when you start asking those kinds of questions, as opposed to trying to solve problems, right. the problems start to dissolve. And one of the things is also that it has to in some ways be relational work. Yes. Very because true. when we're in our own cycles, in our minds, in our bodies, it's hard to witness ourselves. Completely. And when there's a relational mirror, it's like, oh, wow, there it is. And I think that's part of the power of some of our offerings, right? The, the community connection. Um, right. Yeah. So anyways, we uh, will put the link um, in the podcast if folks are interested. We have a Jewish healing container as well as, um, uh, what did we call it? Uh, dis um, orient orienting ourselves in disorienting times. Yeah, that's just open for anyone who wants to come experience some of our modalities together. Um, but I wanted kind of to look, loop back as to when we first met. And I don't know actually if you remember this, but... Um, when we first, you know, connected over planning this Hanukkah event, I asked you a question. The first question I asked you, do you manage to remember it? <laughs> I certainly do not. Well, it's so, such a funny question, but I basically asked you, you know, I'm really curious what your Shabbat dinners are like. Do you, <laughs> do you mean, did you mean like the Mate family Shabbat dinners? Yeah. And I think you were kind of taken aback by that question, but I was always, you know, because for me, Shabbat is very much, you know, this time where we gather and we talk about everything we talk about politics we talk about ancestral yeah. trauma we talk about spirituality we talk about and i was like really curious um to what your experience you know with your family that does so much work and all these various fields like what how how do you hold it all together on a shabbat dinner table so I guess I wanted to ask you um, if you wanted to just share a little bit about your relationship to Judaism. Yeah, um, sure. What it has been, what it is now, and what your understanding of being Jewish in this moment. I mean, it's a, it's a tender question for me, a shaky question. I don't have a solid answer. Um, you know, you've been a stabilizing influence on me in terms of starting to think more about how could I have a positive relationship to Judaism as opposed to here's what I'm not into, here's what I don't like. And I have to go to answer that question. I have to go through the 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 the, the root of that original question that you claim to remember asking me. Um, <laughs> I do remember it actually now, and I don't remember what I said to anyone listening. I'm I'll, I'm going to share some things about my family, you know, and you know, if you ask a podcast guest who has a famous father about their family, you may not expect them to be as candid as I'm about to be. But this is kind of what we do, my dad and I, at least. Um, so my Shabbat dinners were, um, I mean, they summed up the whole container I grew up in around Judaism. It was very ambivalent. Mm -hmm. It was very, it was not consistent. When I was a kid, I do fondly remember years where there was Shabbat dinner every week. There was challah, there was candles. I don't know if we did wine. Um, it was not a religious family. My parents could basically phonetically recite the brachot, the blessings, but it wasn't connected to any sense of Jewish learning. It was a kind of obligatory keeping a certain, almost keeping a certain yardside candle for dead traditions alive, Whoa, almost. Really <laughs> yeah, or, or at least keeping it alive until such time as we can, you know. Yeah. I mean, my dad's a Holocaust survivor. My dad was yeah. born um, in 1944 in the Budapest ghetto. And his parents, both, you know, near escapes from all kinds of um, calamities. My, you know, their their parents died in the Holocaust. And um, at least my grandmothers did. And, um, you know, the extended family was, we loved... Shabbat, we loved Jewish holidays, 
Passover, Hanukkah. It was great. Like we, my, on my dad's side of the family, my mom's side of the family was very uncomfortable with Judaism. Um, just, just not comfortable in it. Um, I think insecure in it. Um, and that was not the Holocaust surviving side of the family, actually. Um, and I don't entirely know the whole story of why yeah. that was, but I don't think it's uncommon uh, in North American, at least Ashkenazi families, where somewhere along the way we lost the thread. Right. And there's something, um, some, what I'm hearing is that in, it's like we're Jewish, but we also kind of have an aversion yeah. to being Jewish at the same time. Yeah. And that, and that aversion is multifaceted. Number one, well, we don't believe in God. Number two, we don't speak Hebrew. I don't think my mom had much of a Hebrew. Like my mom doesn't read Hebrew. I don't know if my dad had a bar mitzvah. I forget. Um, certainly both his brothers grew up more connected to Jewish tradition. And so they retain more of the prayers than he does. But neither of them are particularly religious. Um, my uncle went to Talmud Torah. So, you know, he he had that, um, that education. Um then there's this sort of relationship to the mainstream Jewish community. And I had a father who was a pariah in the mainstream Jewish community. His group, Jews for a Just Peace, during the first intifada in the late 80s, was banned from meeting at the Jewish community center. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that, and, you know, I, and I would go to Hebrew school in preparation for my bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And the rabbi would say to me, you know, Daniel, your father's a, he's a great man. He does great medical work, but his views on Judaism and on, Israel and on Zionism are completely wrong and you shouldn't listen to him. So uh, to me, the mainstream Jewish community was very much a source of um, rejection in a, a fundamental way of, of, of well, the family. Almost, yeah, they were rejecting your family or, you know, so yeah. I can imagine that that's hard to fit in or find belonging. Well, especially since my family was the site of some of the things I value the most about Jewish tradition, dissent, right. critical thought, Heresy. Heresy, 100%. <laughs> bring it on. We got the heretic on the edge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But heresy and prophecy, exactly. which go hand in hand, right? Well, because you have to be willing to go against the group or against right, the norm yep. to speak truth oftentimes. And, you know, I think that's one of the things with all lineages, right? They kind of get intact and then they become rigid. Yep. And then you can't speak out. You know, it, it is it is quite interesting. And you know, I grew up in a very different way in Jerusalem, but but also kind of the sense of that I feel a lot of times in the mainstream Jewish community, especially in the U.S., that it's like, OK, well, we're teaching all these Jewish values and one of them being about questioning, right, that, like using your mind, developing your critical thinking, um, you know, being willing to really wrestle, wrestle with God, wrestle with ourselves, wrestle with the community. But you know, we're not really allowed to ask any questions about Zionism. That's right. And just that cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. that then is created of just like Jewish values of questioning, Jewish values of justice, Jewish values of belonging and all these things. Yeah. And, and we're not fully reckoning and acknowledging Zionism and the many levels of rupture it has created in the world. Um, you know, of course, to Palestinians and also within the Jewish community as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. I mean, to Palestinians, first and foremost, materially, historically, it would change the complete arc of that people's history in a very material way. And for us as well, but for us on, a, on, a, uh, on an even more insidious and subtle level that we don't see. I mean, uh, you've used a phrase uh, that I know you're going to be writing about soon, you know, the Christianization of Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, and if I think back on it, Going to Hebrew school with a Zionist bent, and it's another interesting question: Why did my father send me to a Zion? But it's kind of like there was the, it was the only game in town, really. Yeah. And he was like, "Oh well, you know, he right. would educate us at home." He also sent us to a left wing kibbutz Zionist summer camp. But thinking back on that Hebrew school, it's kind of had a Catholic vibe. <laughs> really? You know, it was kind of giving Catholic. <laughs> and if you think about it, what's the big symbol of Catholicism? The cross. Yeah. Suffering and redemption. Well, what is Zionism? Mm -hmm. You know, it's suffering and redemption. Totally. And it's like, do you accept the state of Israel as your personal savior? Yeah. <laughs> really? And it has that kind of sanitized messianic, me complex, messianic Christian, complex. Um Christian Zionists love also because they're like, great, you're doing our 
dirty work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and never mind if those Christian Zionists are complete anti-Semites. You yeah. know, we'll take their 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 dollars and their and their diplomatic support. So it was complicated. And then there was this um Yeah, there is a very, you know, strong Christianization of Judaism. Hugely. Yeah, I want to hear more about it because yeah. that's I, I mean you're I know you're gonna be writing about it, but can you give oh. us a sneak preview? Yeah. I mean, there's so much to say. I mean, obviously, so much of my work is about Arab Jews and the way that Jews were uprooted from Muslim societies and um, the relationship between Jews and Muslims have been intentionally ruptured. Um, but I think that even with Ashkenazi Jewish community, who you know was largely um, around Christian empire for some centuries, um, there is a sense of like, well, you know, I, th I, I think that there's there's a way of, of um, and you can let me know what you think, because you're the Ashkenazi Jew, but just the ways and I feel that there's been kind of this choice post Holocaust to Ashkenazi Jews. It's like either you westernize and secularize and assimilate into Christian dominance and forget about what makes you different. But, you know, you can have a bit of things like bagel and lox or you know this thing and that thing on the side but largely not really any lineage or any tradition that's actually challenging the main empire or zionism or colonization of palestine or re-indigenizing as you know some people would say in the zionist camp um of, in some ways, you can even think about it as like re-becoming Arab or something like that. Mm. Uh, so so just these polarity of choices um, is something that I think about a lot. Yeah, the I mean, there's also a political dimension to it. And my, you know, um, Norman Finkelstein has talked about this. My brother's talked about this quite a bit. Aaron Maté, the journalist at The Gray Zone. Um, that there's the political component is that in some ways to become Zionist after 1967 was to assimilate into the U.S. power structure because Israel became the U.S.'s little buddy, right. its aircraft carrier in the Middle East. And all of a sudden, the U.S. saw its own regional interests as served by this country being a fortress, yeah. you know, in, in the oil-rich yeah. Arab uh, world. So, And that's one of the things that's also so wild to me sometimes to think about, you know, especially in the Jewish communities, like we think that we're so independent and like this is, you know, sometimes it's seen as like, oh, Zionism, Jewish liberation. And and there's kind of this inability to see it's like, no, no, this is not at all our choice right of our freedom. It's actually something that was set up for us yeah. by British Empire yeah. and then kind of transferred on to U.S. imperialism. And we're still just pawns and like global empire of you know. Yeah, but we're well compensated pawns. We are well compensated. Like like yeah. the 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 I mean, pleasure, <laughs> the pleasures of <laughs> touche. The pleasures of empire are significant. We yeah. like our Scooby snacks, you know, and 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 being, you know, not saying we run Hollywood, but having but 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 having access to political influence and, right. and have and, and in the corporate world or even in the nonprofit world right. just you know and having having status and being comfortable relative to other ethnic groups I'm not saying Jews don't face discrimination sure. or, or resentment or hatred or whatever but it's it's very appealing and so that was able to coexist in fact uh, be kind of part and parcel of a Zionist outlook which is interesting because on the one hand you're assimilating into this society and getting a lot of comfort in it, but your ideology mandates that you maintain a certain kind of one. What if the Nazis come for us tomorrow? Then we have to have a Plan B, where is and that Israel becomes our Plan B, right. you know, and we forget entirely about whose um, Plan A that was and right. who whose Plan A we ruined with that. And also, I mean, as you wrote a whole book about this, but the level of trauma that plays into that loop cycle. Exactly. And there's a lot of Jews who manage to be both Zionist and religious and assimilate. Like, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you look at, you go to a Long Island bar mitzvah. Yeah. A typical Long Island bar mitzvah of some wealthy family in the Hamptons. You're going to see an extremely godless display of of pop culture and and yeah. and 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 showbiz and all kinds of stuff you, know, you might get drake to come perform or whatever oh he's jewish that's not a, it's not a good example yeah, yeah someone else uh but um 
and a lot of sort of religious pomp and circumstance, pageantry. Right. I think there's a lot of pageantry, yeah. you know, yeah. which is the same thing in like, say, the Italian Catholic community or whatever. It's not necessarily all about belief. Now it's about a kind of um, theater right. and feeling feeling belonging to something without yeah. necessarily the deep well, it's meaning. It's artificial belonging. It is artificial belonging, yeah, synthetic. So I'm curious because, you know, since October 7th, you've been speaking up as a Jew for Palestine. Constantly. Constantly, in all sorts of ways, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter or other social media or, you know, doing different podcasts. And yeah. Talks and, um, yeah, like, I'm, I'm curious to just hear you speak a little bit about how you see this intersection of, like, Jewish identity, being a Jew for Palestine, standing again. I mean, your family has stood against Zionism for so long and has faced so much backlash, you know, in your own development of your relationship to Judaism. So, yeah, I'm just curious to hear how you are holding that, especially in this moment, right, which is a crisis moment, yeah. um, an ongoing crisis that is kind of doesn't end even though we we pray and we act and we hope every day that right there'll be a ceasefire but you know the, there there is this ongoing genocide that's happening that's that's so so urgent and um you know you've also been yeah just connecting with so many people like really a wide range of people who come from wide range of beliefs right some of them Zionists who are trying to unlearn some of them are Zionists who are trying to be antagonistic right like you're you're taking some people down on Twitter you're calling some people out in the psychology so I'm just kind of curious how you're holding all of that right now yeah I don't know if I'm taking them down I'm certainly I'm, I'm certainly making a lot of people laugh at them which yeah. it's is is sometimes is the best we can do um yeah it's a great question um it's a huge question let me see. I'm going to take an uncharacteristic pause. <laughs> well, I, I just, guess, I guess the thing that for me, right, because I think for so many Jews, the ways that Zionism has just been such a big part of the educational system sure. requires such deep unlearning. Yes. And, you know, for you, of course, yeah, you had this experience of being in Zionist summer camp, but you also grew up in a very anti-Zionist. Yeah, I never fully swallowed the Zionist pill. You never fully swallowed never it. Never fully blue pilled in that yeah. sense. Uh, blue and white pilled. I, um, yeah, look, I come at it from a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad will always say, I'm not anti-Zionist, I'm just pro-truth. Right. You know, which is fine. Like, okay, like, I'm, I, I don't love isms either, but yeah. functionally speaking, Zionism is what, as Zionism does. And what Zionism does is ruining a lot of things that I love, including the human lives of Palestinians. Yeah. History is being erased. Much that I love about Jewish culture is being erased. And also just culture and sanity and humor are being erased. Like it's yeah. just so it's just so offensive to me on so many levels, aesthetically, intellectually, emotionally, politically, and all that. So I oppose it in all these grounds. And then as a mental chiropractor, my job is to help people get unstuck. Well, if I look at Zionism and what it's done to the Jewish consciousness the collective jewish consciousness is just a giant stuckness inside a massive trauma vortex mm -hmm. that is insatiable and so it sucks as many other people into it as possible as our antagonists our enemies or our friends and it has the potential to destroy the planet yeah. i mean it really is that much of a nexus i mean you're you're from there you know yeah. what a what a what a um you know miraculous and cataclysmic set of coordinates that is yeah you know a lot rides on it so when i when october 7th happened i just knew that there was going to be an incredible amount of bullshit being mm -hmm. talked um because propaganda, I, really. propaganda unquestioned assumptions and profoundly uninsightful and misleading ways of making sure people don't understand october 7th right under the guise of we can't let this happen again, but in fact, almost praying for it to happen again. Yeah. And that level of disconnect from reality Whoa. struck me as just in, I just couldn't not say something. And so I just picked up my phone on October 8th and I just recorded me walking and talking, which is when I do my best thinking really. And that spun into it becoming almost a full-time job. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, so much of your modality around um, 
understanding where we get stuck in the mind is bringing in this awareness that sometimes our ways of thinking are creating the realities of which we think we don't want or we're trying to avoid, but are kind of inevitable. It's not just they're inevitable. There's a part of us that desires them. Right. That's the, the fundamental inauthenticity yeah. is that we pretend to ourselves that we don't want October 7th to happen again. Right. Now, that sounds like a shocking thing to contradict. Why yeah. would anyone want October 7th to happen again? Yeah. It's not that they want it to happen again, but it is that they don't know who they would be without, it without the threat of it happening again. And they also don't know who they would be if they zoomed out even just a little bit wide enough to see that their attachments and their loyalties and their illusions um, played a massive role, though, which they share with many other people. So those collective delusions, in effect, made October 7th inevitable. And so it's almost like we're praying for it to happen while speaking words that suggest the opposite. Right. And that's a kind of inauthenticity that I can't just let slide. Not because I'm going to like call people out. For, I mean, I do call people out for being hypocrites and I get snarky and whatever, but it's also just out of love. Yeah. Like it's an addiction totally. and people are being psychotic. It's a yeah. kind of mass psychosis and lunacy that is very dangerous <laughs> and very, um, very sad and heartbreaking. And, and I seem to have some capacity to, um, speak to it in I, I'm starting to think of it as phase shifting because I don't just have one tone mm -hmm. like I can be very sharp and direct I can be very calm and compassionate I can be very snarky and cruel yeah. and not cruel but but ruthless pointed. just pointed and ruthless I can be very light and humorous and I can be kind and kind of what like I oh, and I sounds like you're human it's like I'm human <laughs> but I'm like I find it's like I'm phase shifting it's like some science fiction movie where I don't know, some being learns how to like shift between dimensions qu too quick for the other beings to like catch them. The bullet can't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, you, you can't pin me down. And and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to, sh yeah. and then I'm, and then I'm trying to, I guess, show people that there's many different ways to carry this and many different ways to speak to it and that they're all valid. Yeah. Well, one thing that you said about um, the conditions of the mind around October 7th and Zionism you know, I think that there's such a kind of easy out that a lot of people in the Jewish community take around, oh, well, they just all hate us. And yes. That's why. Yeah. Oh, just anti semitism And, you know, of course, anti-Semitism is a big issue that actually needs to be talked about in a serious way. But when it's downplayed in that way, that it's so disconnected from the reality of what has been happening to Palestinians, what the apartheid regime has met, right? Like all of these, um, these contexts, and and I think that, you know, I, one uh, for me, one of the work that I do is to really understand, okay, like, especially in the Jewish community, there's a really deep rupture with a sense of belonging to this world. Yeah. Um, you know, part of that is historical trauma, genocides, oppressions, all of that. But also identity. We've an developed identity. an identity about being everyone hates us. Right. Right. There's something very kind of latched in. And, and it's really hard to, on the one hand, right, how do we actually belong to this world when we so deeply believe that we don't? Like, is that even possible? Mm -hmm. And and I think I, one of the other questions that I asked you when we first um, started speaking, I don't know if you remember this one, but I asked you, why don't you and your dad write a book, you know, similar to the myth of normal, but about Zionism? Mm about how Zionism has become so normalized, especially in the Jewish community, when it's so completely not normal. Um, so yeah, I'm curious actually, if you want to share a bit about how you see that connection, because I also want to hear about the work that you've been doing with the myth of normal, which is really groundbreaking work, you know, people resonating all over the world with this um, understanding that actually we are in a sick society. Mm -hmm. The part of the reason that we are individually sick is not because we there's something wrong with us individually, right? right? And I think oftentimes I, I think a lot of Jewish people feel that in Jewish community, especially if they're anti-Zionist, they feel like there's something wrong with them. Yes. When really it's like no, no, there's something wrong with the institution. There's something wrong with the culture. There's something wrong with the society. Yeah, you're having a normal reaction to an abnormal set of yeah. environmental conditions. Yeah. Before I answer that, can I just tell you a quick joke? Sure. Uh, that's. So when you talk about the, you know, 
the why did the, they, they they just hate us mm. and that's why October 7th happened. It reminds you, of course, of, you know, George Bush's brilliant, sophisticated explanation for 9-11. They hate us for our freedom. Right. It's an explanation that explains nothing. Yeah, I mean, like, the West is so free. Exactly, exactly. And because I've spent a little time talking to you, I know what Yanni means. <laughs> it's a little Arabic interjection, yeah. right? Um, yeah, the, the West is so free. And that's what, and that's what you know, Al-Qaeda is spending time resenting. Like, we must, oh, we, their, their hamburgers, we're so jealous of them or something like that. But anyway the um the whole uh you know october 7th just because happened just because they hate us therefore we have to go do more of the shit that we've done that's resulted in them hating us mm -hmm. you know what the definition of chutzpah is like a sort of prototypical analogy or or parable about the definition of chutzpah is that like the einstein quote about insanity no 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 that, no no that's different no 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 it's no it's a <laughs> like 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 all great Yiddish folk wisdom. It comes from sort of a uh, a story involving you know parents and children often you know, and it's the it's the the young man who murders both his parents, and then throws himself on the mercy of the court on the grounds that he's an orphan. Mm -hmm. So he's pleading for them not to find him guilty. He's like, please don't find me guilty. I have no parents, uh -huh. so don't find me guilty of murdering my parents. Right, right. You know, and there's something about that in Zionism. Yeah, analogy yeah it's like the self-victimization that's the exactly right crime. that's exactly right well that's the that exactly that's the beauty that right nutshell. that is Zionism in a nutshell and and that is also Ashkenazi folk wisdom in a nutshell <laughs> which is the ability to recognize the hypocrisy yeah. and ludicrousness and absurdity of human behavior including our own starting with our own yeah you know the wise men of Helm was my favorite stories as a kid these fools these religious educated fools in this the shtetl you know and they were adorable, but they were also just completely um, full of themselves and and blind. And and to me, that's one of the great things we have to offer. And Zionism has has really killed a lot of people's sense of humor about themselves and self awareness. Um, in terms of the normalization of of Zionism, yeah, look, the myth of normal. And I should say that when it comes to the myth of normal, that's a book that I co-authored, kind of as a hired gun. the The main yes. thesis is my father's. It's the summation of his work. Our next book will be much more of a 50-50 collaboration on a topic much more personally intimate to me, parent-adult-child relationships. But I, you know, I've certainly taken interest in the topic now that I've written on it with him. Um, yeah, we live in a society that creates conditions that do not meet basic human needs and then pathologizes the absolutely natural ways that human beings try to cope with that or suffer from it. Um, and says, and then individualizes uh, the symptoms. And of course, part of what was wrong or not fitting or not or, or lacking about the conditions in the first place is that it, everything was individualized. We were taken out of the collective setting. We evolved. I think the the the, the analogy is like if all of human history was an hour on a clock, the last six minutes are the only time when we haven't lived in small band hunter gatherer groups. Mm -hmm. So our entire biology developed yeah. to be in a certain context, which means that a human being is born as an expectation for a certain environment, literally. A certain relationship. relationship. A, a certain environment that privileges and, and foregrounds relationship yeah. um, where parenting is not simply done by two stressed, young, inexperienced, untutored, unmentored, and highly traumatized individuals, yeah. but rather an entire network of people that supports those people. It's an entire village sure. um, where there's collective ritual and collective meaning and collective myth-making in the positive sense of the word yeah. myth. Um, that's and a connection to land, storytelling, nature, the seasons, all this kind of stuff. Everything that um, what we so self-flatteringly refer to as civilization has devalued, uprooted, and kind of pushed aside in the interests of other concerns that are born more of the individual ego, like how much more can I make? How much more can I produce? How much more can I extract? Yeah. How much more can I manipulate? How many people can I control or even own, right? And it just metastasizes from there. So now we're living in the world that that mentality made. And that mentality was born of a fundamental breach. You talk about a rupture. There was a rupture at a certain point. Yeah. And you know, some people date it to the beginning beginning of agriculture, 
when we when we stopped working with subsistence farming and and sort of the or sorry um, hunter gathering sure. just working with the changing migration patterns of animals and seasons or whatever and now we're going to take a plot of land we're going to say you are carrots and you are carrots year round and we're going to get as many carrots out of you as possible well yeah. you've fundamentally changed your relationship to uh the earth and what you've done all of a sudden is vastly increased your ability to be quote unquote productive mm -hmm. and you may not see the costs in your generation or even for 10 generations but there are consequences so anyway modern late stage capitalism is the ultimate realization mm -hmm. and nightmare of that mentality we are now born inside of it which means we're being born into families that are stressed are traumatized are isolated with parents who are having to work multiple jobs just to fund just to provide the basics social supports are falling apart all this stuff yeah we have leaders that are deeply traumatized that's why we elect them because they appeal to our our wounds mm -hmm. and they exploit them and then they create conditions that deepen the wounds so it's a whole cycle and then that just becomes normal like right. wa water to fish right. you know with fish don't even know what water is because they're just in it well and one thing that i you know i was very influenced by this book and this way of thinking because um there's so much also psychological understanding of how addiction works in there yeah right when you don't have a need met and you have this false understanding of where it might be met and then you become addicted to it and whether we think about it in the pharmaceutical industry or in all sorts of ways and obviously the systems who uh, capitalize on that desire but yeah just kind of going back to zionism because i know that's something that we talked a lot about is just like understanding zionism as a form of addiction absolutely really, yeah, yeah, yeah right where it's like they're like as i mean obviously there's different forms of zionism but if we're just talking about within the jewish community it's like to me, it feels like part of the attachment to Zionism is from coming from this place of desire for belonging oh, yeah. in the world. But there's a false understanding of what that means to receive that. And the attachment to Zionism is necessarily not going to bring the belonging that is desired. But because it's an addiction, right, it kind of spirals out. So it's like, oh, well, more Zionism, more colonization, more, you know. My favorite quote about addiction, my dad quoted it in his previous book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghost, is by an addiction researcher named Vincent Felitti, hmm. who said it's hard to get enough of something that almost works. Right. And um, I don't know if Zionism even almost works, but it seems to almost work because we got to a place where like, oh, we have a state. Oh, we have a flag. Oh, we have a place where we can gather. Oh, our, our national language national yeah. language has been reborn and we you know and you can feel that way when you go to israel you know and you grew up there and and um and yet there's something being missed out which are the consequences and reverberations and the things that have been lost and i think you're absolutely right and and it's possible to be somewhere physically but not really be there and not really belong and then what that creates of course um what's his name there's a really excellent lengthy tweet about this uh from um i forget his name i think he's israeli he certainly has a hebrew name i'll, I'll remember it later who talks about how you know it just necessarily creates a hatred of the people who do belong or who did right 100%. and that's the col the, col the colonial mindset 100%. you have to destroy them or wipe them out or push them yeah. away because they are a reminder of your own homelessness totally and that i think is my theory of oppression is that that's part of how oppression works right is that the oppressor has such a deep void inside for yeah. something. And then they look at the people who still have that. I mean, you can look at the same thing in colonization of Turtle Island, right? When mm -hmm. the indigenous people have, um, right? Like for, for the colonizer, they have such a deep desire to belong and they look at the people who do belong and they want to take that away from them. That's right. And they don't know that by taking it away from them, they're taking it away from themselves even more, <laughs> you That's know? Right. And, and just that loop that then gets, you know, um, amplified and spiraled over generations. And, you know, it's kind of like, which actually brings me to the, my next question, because, you know, you co-authored The Myth of Normal, which talks very in depth about trauma and healing. Um, but those are two words that frustrate you sometimes. Um, and, you know, you developed your own method um, and that's not really about healing trauma, but actually about getting unstuck. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can just share a little bit about that difference for you. And, you know, what does that mean to 
on the one hand, honor, right, the spirals of trauma that we are born into, that we perpetuate, that we're kind of in that cycle versus, right, this modality of transformation, which is really about um, not necessarily, right, healing all of that, but actually making different choices. Yeah, and seeing things differently now. Sure. Yeah, so about trauma and healing. Look, I can't separate out the the personal and biographical from like the the principled or ideological or whatever. Like, of course, my aversion <laughs> to these words, and I I actually don't have an aversion to them. I use them all the time. I just try not to overuse them, and I'm very sensitive to the ways in which they can be overused. Well, why is that? Well, that's my lineage. Um, not only am I someone seeking healing. Um, after a childhood characterized by some emotional wounding, but I'm also sort of the heir apparent to, uh, you know, a family business built around trauma and healing. Like my dad is these days associated very strongly all over the world with these two uh, concepts, and rightly so. He's done incredible work at raising people's awareness of the wounds they're carrying and and not just that but the consequences of those wounds on their current mental physical and spiritual well-being incredible contribution that i would never um, want to diminish or disrespect and then there's me um i am in some ways inoculated to his approach because in you know, part of the my wounding was that he didn't just know how to be a dad. He had to sort of be a therapist or a doctor or whatever. And so his discomfort with whatever I was going through would translate into, well, you tried this, or when are you going to heal that? Or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or this is because you're traumatized and blah, blah, blah. So these words took on a certain kind of uh, allergenic quality for me. Yeah. And then, and then coupled with, I want to hear what you want to say, but coupled with the fact that I know experientially when something has shifted and when it hasn't and i love when things shift yeah i don't just want to hear about knowing why something is the way it is if knowing why something is the way it is doesn't shift my experience of it fundamentally i'm not that interested in it now i know that for a lot of people getting that oh wow my als or my addiction or my bipolar disorder or whatever is a consequence of my trauma that does shift something for them it gets them off their own case it gives them compassion for themselves it might even give them compassion for their own parents because it connects them to intergenerational trauma very important work there comes a point though where i get interested in, in okay what next what now what do we want to do with that and what i've seen and this is just typical of anything spiritual or healing oriented that becomes an industry or a product that can be sold there can be an addiction itself to trauma and healing. Yeah, well, that's actually what I was just going to say. And you see that also in the spiritual community Completely. as well. And that's actually, you know, spiritual lineages warn about this because when you start out on your spiritual path, your healing path, you just want more. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're all the time, oh, yeah. more, more, more. And I had that as well, too. When I was sitting, I was like, this modality and that modality. And let's, and what's wrong with me? And let's keep going. Yeah. And, you know, and, yeah. and, and you kind of do that. And you think you're doing so well because oh, yeah. you're constantly examining. But at a certain level, you're also harming yourself. You're either harming yourself or you're keeping yourself stuck or you're you're just you're get you're getting further and further away without realizing it exactly. from who you think you are or you're or or from who you actually want to be deep down and then you're getting attached to this new identity as oh I'm someone on a healing journey right or I'm a spiritual person or whatever and I got I fell into this too when I discovered transformational yeah. workshops they changed my life they gave me a palpable sense of oh my god my experience can shift in one moment but then it was like I need more, I need more, I need more. And not only that, I need everyone in my life to have exactly okay. the same experience. The ironic thing about that is that when you're stuck in that way of thinking, you often look at people who you deem unhealed. You look at, you look down on them. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and then it's, it's kind of this, um, this loop because on the one hand you're like, well, I'm healing the world, but I'm looking down at the people. And the, yeah. I'm actively so. creating more and more unhealed people around me because yeah. I can't heal healed people. Right. Yeah. yeah, which is kind of this really it just comes down to the same issue that I think collectively we all have, which is the inability to be present with what is. That's exactly right, which is ultimately what spiritual and healing yeah. work wants to say. It's trying it's, to lead. That's what its yeah. core intention is. 
So anyway, I spent a lot of time. There was a, a time in my late 30s, early 40s, where I really didn't know quite what I was doing with my life. My musical theater work had hit a kind of um, plateau. And I was back living in British Columbia, where I'm from. And I found myself in my dad's circles a lot, including some of his psychedelic assisted workshops. And I would see him do work with groups. And I was always very impressed by what he did. It was powerful. Mm -hmm. But I would also have this sense of like, okay, come on. Like, what's that Hebrew phrase you, you taught me? Les arrêts in yan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, let's get to the point. Like, let's, like, okay, but what like, for? Like, hurry up. Like, what now? Okay, yeah. great. You know, you were traumatized. At a certain point, I've developed a, uh, a little, you know, a little, a little slogan, uh, you know, with kids, you know, we, the kids chant, I scream, you scream, or, you scream, I scream, we all scream for ice cream. So I say, I'm traumatized, you're traumatized, we all scream for ice cream. Like, it's just, at this point, we all know we're traumatized. We right. all, almost everyone knows it now. Yeah. Like, if they didn't a few years ago, the myth of normal came out, and now everyone knows it. <laughs> And and it does become, you know, and you've kind of said this to me that I, I see this happening a lot, right? Where um, we just blame our own trauma for our the ways that we act, yep. and then it actually avoids accountability and responsibility. One hundred percent. And it becomes this loop of it's like, well, my trauma and my trauma and my trauma. Well, and I and it's it's a it's a to, it's a dog chasing its tail. Yeah. And I saw it in my own family, quite frankly. Yeah. I saw patterns that had been acknowledged for decades still not changing. And I'm like, well, if 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 this knowledge is so valuable then why hasn't it changed? And if it's not going to change, then why talk about it? Just go, just go be a jerk. Like, just do it. Don't, don't bother me with your, your like insight about it, your theory or like, Oh, cause you're just making yourself feel better that now you just, Oh, you know how deep you've got it. And I've done exactly the same thing myself. Sure. And it's a very easy thing to do, especially in close relationships. So anyway, I just found that when I worked with people, I had a more direct approach. I was not so reverent about people's pain. I was not so gentle and so, like if you see my dad work with people, he's usually sitting cross-legged and he'll lean in like this and there should be a real slowness and gentleness. And people tell me that it's like very soothing to them. I don't soothe people. Yeah. I regulate them, but in a different kind of way. Yeah. It's kind of a like, okay, cool. I got it. What's your intention? Right. Trying, to, trying to wake them up into a present moment. Okay. All that happened. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Let's touch into it. Let's have it as a reference point. You come by whatever you're struggling with very honestly. It's not your fault. Absolutely. Now, Back to the present moment. What can we shift right now? And my contention is, and what I've found over and over again with people when I take these walks, and I've probably walked with about a thousand people now, um, the minute someone has a small shift in one aspect of their life, this is why I don't call it healing, I call it getting unstuck, because I don't know what healing means. I don't know what the benchmark is for healing. I don't know when you can say I've healed. Healing is constantly happening. Nature is healing all the time by itself. It's not even something you have to do. It's doing you. But when something palpably shifts in your experience, like, oh, half an hour ago, I was up in arms about this thing with my parents. And now I'm just now I'm experiencing freedom and peace. Have I healed my trauma? Probably not, whatever that means. But I had a shift. I got unstuck. I see options I didn't see. I feel feelings I couldn't feel. I've reconnected with parts of myself that I was estranged from. The minute that happens, even if that's like superficial or on the surface, that sends a reverberation down to the deepest levels of the trauma and says, hey, guess what? It ain't necessarily so. You are not the chief arbiter of reality, my yeah. trauma. And maybe your days are numbered. Maybe this is the way of things. Maybe the door only swings one way. Yeah, and I think what's powerful about your modality is that in some ways it is that your intention is way more powerful than your trauma. 100%. Your intention is way more powerful than your trauma in the present moment. Yeah, and how? The difference is, and here's the difference, but this is the good thing. It puts you in the driver's seat. Your trauma does not need to be rebooted. Mm -hmm. It reboots itself. Right. Your intention does. It requires your subscription. Shows. You are subscribed to your trauma by default. It's like right. one of these subscriptions. You go through your computer and you find out that you're what paying. Pay Why am I paying five dollars? What, what is it? What even is this cancel. service? Where do I cancel? Exactly. Where and you can't find it. It's totally uncancelable, <laughs> right? We do that. Our our trauma yeah. and our stories and our stuck working theories and all of the structures of our mind that keep us seeing the world the same way. Which is the imprint of our trauma? Mm -hmm. What is trauma? But a lasting wound. It's like a lasting, um, yeah, it's a wound to our experience of ourselves. Yeah. We keep subscribing to these ways of seeing the world and ways of speaking about the world and ways of 
cognating about the world, cognizing, cognizing about the world that keep that traumatized experience going. That doesn't require anything. You are, you wake up in the morning, you're triggered waiting to happen. Right. And you're already just by default doing that. It's automatic. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just there. And it will drive us. It's a pattern. And it's like, you know, that's why it's so much easier to roll a gutter ball in bowling than it is to like right down the center of the lane. Right. Intention says, okay, here I am today. It's not making a resolution for the whole year. The whole year. It's like, what's my intention for this conversation? Or as I have people say on my walks, my intention for this walk is I'm aware that I am here. There's a certain period of time. And to my best extent, I'm going to put my intention on an experience that I would like to privilege over the familiar. It's not positive thinking. It's not ignoring the bad stuff. It's saying, what is this actually for rather than what am I trying to get rid of? Yeah. And the minute you do that, your relationship to your trauma automatically changes because you're like, oh, yeah, there it is. Ah, that feels familiar in a, a way I, I, I don't like. Okay, cool. Now, what thoughts make it feel more like that and what thoughts make it feel yeah. less like that? And now you start to find the levers on the cockpit that actually, you know, the mechanics of your own, the relationship between the way your mind is framing reality and the, the, the experiential reality you get to live inside of. Yeah, which is, you know, actually a big part of my work also in God Fellowship around thinking about this relationship between the mind and the experience. Um, and, you know, it's so, so interesting because sometimes it's like when we think thoughts, we just think all of our thoughts are equal. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, that thought and that thought. But actually the thoughts are coming from different, you know, you could say even memories, experiences, parts, if we were going the IFS route, right? Yeah. But, but um, they have different level. there's different structures, right, yes. that are created through these thoughts. And you would say different energetic frequencies and resonances, right? Sure, Yeah. Yeah, and just, you know, right, just like your car needs a tune-up, your mind needs a tune-up quite regularly. You know, this is, for me, one of the things that is so important to me in spiritual practice. And I, I was going to tell you this, which I don't know if I've said it to you, but, but the way that you're speaking about intention and choosing intention, like, that is actually prayer, right? Because when you wake up in the morning, you wait, like, the reason why prayer happens first thing when you wake up, because you know that if you wake up and you don't pray, what's going to happen? All of the distractions, all of the patterns, mm. all of the cycles, all of the things from yesterday, mm. they're going to come up. Mm. So you want to start your day with prayer, which is an intention, you know, and, and different traditions have like a, this is what you say. You don't mm -hmm. pick an intention. Mm. I mean, you could, but right. But there's a a, a level of, of wisdom, um, intention to be loving, intention to be free of suffering. Right. right. And even the language like may this come to pass or sure. blessed, you know, you're sort of blessing a certain aspect of reality. Yeah. You're, 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 you're giving reality some three dimension. You're saying, okay, this is, this is what we're focusing on. This is what we're putting our attention on. Yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, the, the work of spiritual hygiene is so, so, so crucial and underrated and underrated yeah. it's an ongoing practice it's not like i attained this experience and now i'm evolved right it's like actually every day and and i think that you know just like you have to take a shower every day to cleanse your physical body you also have to do some work to cleanse your internal body mm -hmm. right your your mental your emotional and and what i really love about your modality is this um yeah because when you're able to see the trauma loop and the way that it can come up you also are able to see the level of choice you have yeah to be free from it yeah or do, not to me and what i like because yeah. I, I don't know if i said this to you actually but i used to like very much in my 20s my mindset was very much i have this trauma i need to get it out of me <laughs> you know like yeah. i need to do whatever it takes to get this trauma out of my body have fun with that yeah <laughs> well, you know to be fair i did <laughs> well uh, yeah sure <laughs> but no i mean i've learned so much through that yeah. you know that did it. i think that i think it's actually a core part of learning is to have that dedication yes right because when the suffering in your body is so intense you've got you, to you just are like whatever it will take let me find that's right the way that's right so there's something you know quite necessary about that yes. but it's just one step in that journey it is it is. And if you make the litmus test for being healed, that the trauma goes away and never comes back, you're right. going to be really, really frustrated and down in yourself. Which you I know? was. Or, or you're going to be hyper-focused on 
you're just going to be kind of self-absorbed in a way that yeah. doesn't actually serve what, if you could stop for a second and say, how would I want to be living? Like what I often ask people, you know, when people don't know what their intention is, and, you know, you could say this to someone who's on a healing journey, well, what are you healing for? Right. Why heal? Right. Yeah. You know, like why accelerate your healing? You know, like you have one, like just live your life. Well, so I can be happy. Why would you want to be happier? Well, so I can be more present. Why would you want to be more present? Get in touch with what experience would actually be available to you if that healing happened. Yeah. And then let's skip the middleman. Let's put our focus for this next conversation on that experience. Yeah. Is it power? Is it freedom? Is it self-expression? Is it effervescence? Is it, you know, when everything we do is for an experience. And 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 if we actually say, okay, if that's the end goal of my healing, when you keep talking about healing and healing and healing, you may notice that there's an energetic frequency to that word that actually tenses you up inside. Yeah, the sure. word itself becomes a kind of, I don't know, a whip that you're trying to drive the, yeah. the horse of transformation with or something like that, as opposed to just my intention in this moment is the kind of spaciousness that I imagine would happen if I was completely healed. Well, you know, something just landed for me around you saying that, right? About you specifically naming the self-absorption that can happen yeah. when we become in some ways addicted to that. Which I know nothing about personally. I've never been never caught up in it. But the trauma and the healing. But just to bring it back to Zionism, uh, bit, right? Because there's so much of that. That's, yeah, on a, right? on a national scale. Yeah, yeah. On a national scale of like, our trauma, our trauma, our trauma. And and, and it's not, it, and it's tricky sometimes because, it's, right, especially being two Jewish people who, care deeply about our Jewishness or Jewish people, all of that, right? And 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 the trauma that lives in us. It's hard sometimes to, how do we not let that awareness of trauma take us into the self-absorption loop that actually disconnects us from the possibilities of truly making different realities for ourselves and our people, Yeah, which is, you know, a world free of Zionism. Um, but... But or again, free from it. Or free from it, right. But it, it just as a way that you were speaking, I was like really seeing that, that sometimes that happens in the Jewish community where there's a the, there's a really big self-absorption with our own trauma right. that actually doesn't allow us to even heal it. Yeah, well, the key distinction also from the myth of normal is that trauma is not what happened to you. It's what happened inside of you as a result or a consequence of what happened sure. to you. What happened inside of you is that certain things got disconnected from other things, certain things got fractured, and going forward, you carried forward an interpretive scheme, a set of stories or conclusions that you drew from what happened to you. Yeah. So whether you're a Zionist or you're a non-Zionist or an anti-Zionist or none of the above, the Holocaust happened. To you know, for every Jew in the world, I know the Holocaust didn't happen to Israeli Jews, some. or some, some, but not primarily. But the Holocaust is a historical fact. The question is, what did you make it mean? Right. You know. Uh, I've actually seen Holocaust survivors have transformational experiences where they realize they've been carrying Auschwitz around with them forever. And in, in, a, in a moment, they put it down because they realize it, they didn't make, they're the ones who made it mean that. Now, of course, they made it mean what they made it mean, that the yeah. world isn't friendly, or that God is dead or whatever. So to, to heal our trauma, we have to take responsibility for the meaning we made from it. Say, can I really stand on this meaning? Yeah. Now, Zionism made a certain meaning. But of course, it's not just the Holocaust because Zionism came around 60 years before the Holocaust and was already making that meaning, which is that Jewish suffering, Jewish exiled, Jewish strangerhood is shameful, wrong, um, or at least in, unacceptable or intolerable. That's a whole other conversation I have about Jewish shame. And well, like that. Completely. And it's woven into us. And the, you know, it's the, the irony of them calling us self-hating Jews. Zionism is one of the most self-loathing based ideologies totally. in the world. It's, it's a, filled with hatred for who Jewish people have been. <laughs> yeah, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro talks about this great, and you know, you go back and read Jabotinsky, you see it. So, and that creates a self because self-loathing creates self-absorption because right. you're trying to you're trying to eliminate the self you mm -hmm. hate, and if you can't eliminate eliminate within yourself, then you'll eliminate within your own community. Cast mm -hmm. out the. The, the 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 haters and the and the traitors the heretics, the heretics exactly us uh, yeah it's <laughs> nice out here i like it um because we're finding that actually we can create our own world in the bigger world but if you can't and then if that's not enough then you gotta 
cast out the the others, right? right. The Palestinians. So the, and, the, you know, I think that's something that's just so intense to see and witness the way that Palestinians are made to bear the burden of Jewish trauma and like have that projected and have all the centuries of anti-Semitism be like blamed and projected and and yeah, just this viciousness um, of, of the way that that manifestation of trauma and political interest and nationalism is all um, creating this moment. There's something so deeply heartbreaking there. Yeah, and it almost sometimes, I, it kind of stops me in my tracks. I'm like, oh, it's almost just even obscene to be sitting here and talking about the Jewish internal process. You know, when, like, if I was Palestinian, how would I forgive this? How would I move on from this? How many centuries would it take? What would be required? That's not mine to answer, but it is mine to be aware of that it's unanswerable yeah. and that it has to be reckoned with. But in the meantime, what you and I are trying to do is to wake people up to, there is another story we can tell about our suffering. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm sure in the spiritual world, I think you've spoken to me about this, that there's an inquiry, a Talmudic inquiry into the meaning of suffering. Mm -hmm. What is suffering for and how much suffering is too much? And what do we do with suffering that's too much? And what are the possible responses to it? And are we accountable for the choice we make <laughs> even under the greatest duress? Right. Like, can we hold ourselves to say that there's no trauma so big that I relinquish my responsibility for the choices I make around it once I have those choices. Because yeah. when you're stuck inside a trauma loop, you actually have no choice. Right. But what I'm seeing with a lot of Zionist Jews right now that are clinging for dear life to their Zionism, quite frankly, because it hasn't gotten uncomfortable enough yet, it's just uncomfortable enough to make them agonize right. day in, day out right now. But it's not uncomfortable enough that they have to give it up. Is they're just kind of, they're just holding on hmm. rather than anything but saying wow might i be creating my own suffering right if you're not going to wake up for the sake of others i mean you, when you're in, when you're inside your own trauma loop others don't really exist mm -hmm. it's a narcissistic place so fine they can't see palestinian suffering even with the the most graphic horrific images we've ever seen sure that makes me angry it makes me want to judge them but i can get it they're inside their own matrix but at least for your own sake wake up to what you're doing to yourself. It's like that Radiohead song, you do it to yourself and that's what really hurts. Yeah. You know, and and uh, and then of course we love to tell the Palestinians that they're doing it to themselves. Right. You know, like, why don't you stop hitting you, hitting yourself? Like that's, you know, the childhood bully. Yeah, like they're bombing themselves. The uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, you know. They're displacing themselves. Yeah, and those little babies are time traveling 20 years in the, in the past and voting in Hamas because they, I mean, they have a death wish. It is so interesting because, I, I mean, I think about this a lot with my artwork and, you know, like there's so much about oppression in, in general, but in Zionism specifically, that functions, right, in this level of psychological projection. I mean, we should talk way more deeper than this. I don't know if we have time for today to really fully get into that. But Part but, two. Yeah, part two, but just like the way that psychological projection, right, everything that we internally like the Jewish Zionist world does to themselves, they're actually projecting that onto post, right? Which is the gaslighting. And the, uh, and, and, and I, I'd never heard this phrase before, but it, every day it gets proven more and more. Every accusation is a confession, sure. whether it's rape, whether it's, um, uh, and I'm not getting into the details of what, what has or hasn't happened, but every single accusation that's made, yeah, you could multiply it by a hundred and you'd have the truth about what right. Zionism has done. And I think that there's just something about, how our reality and how our humanness is working in That's this right. realm. But this is what happens when something is unacknowledged, it is exposed and yeah. projected onto others. Yeah, and I just had this something just dropped in for me, like this big sigh mm -hmm. of like, yes, it's all very human and we're not special, but fuck, why do we Jews and we have we Palestinians have to be the ones on this world stage proving it, like yeah. demonstrating it, like this horrible broadway show that never closes and yeah. keeps living out the same like it's, it's just um, terrible the worst musical of all time it's horrifying you know and, and you know that that is in my bad days i think like that but in my good days i'm like and what the what are the possibilities here because right now that's that's the way that it's functioning but 
whoa, can we find the leverage points to shift so that instead of it being this insanity horror, it can actually function as a as a, a mirror of healing. Well, look, here's where you and I come in, and not just you and I, but all the amazing fellow Jews, but especially all the amazing Palestinians that are coming into my life. They've been in your life for a long time. There's never been a moment like this. Yeah. When I talk about possibility, human beings are connecting with each other on this issue in ways that has never happened before. Yeah. I've never seen it. Of course, it's happened in the Israeli-Palestinian space. I know that you know the Israeli left wing, the anti-Zionist Israeli anti-apartheid wing has always been there, but it's always been pretty marginal. But now across the world and in both diasporas, we won't yeah. use that term, there's collaboration happening. There's new friendships happening. I've done Instagram. I did an Instagram live with uh, our mutual friend, Hanin, where I was cooking a Palestinian fish dish. She, was, she gave me the recipe and we did it. We, like I did a cooking show. Yeah. I did a cooking <laughs> show with a Palestinian. Yeah. That that's the possibility right. you know now of course it's also the necessity we're not doing it under happy circumstances right this is not kumbaya right but necessity is the mother of invention innovation improvisation mm -hmm. and going beyond the limits of what seems possible yeah and that you and i have met that we're having this conversation and that we're engaged in a network of conversations with people with maybe not identical but that certainly uh aligned sure. intentions yeah. Um, brilliant, brilliant people all over the world is, I think, some evidence. It's not proof, but it's some evidence at least that there's more going on in this moment yeah. than just the way too obvious, calamitous, tragic, heartbreaking horror, which is happening. Yeah. Well, we only have a few more minutes left. And, um, yeah, there's so many things that we haven't touched on yet that I would love to spend more time, hours talking about, but just curious if there's anything you wanted to share that we haven't talked about yet. Hmm. Yeah, the, the thing that these days always is like an afterthought for me, and it's like the saddest thing is uh, my work as a musical theater writer, which for 15 years was my main identity. Yeah. Um, and really when COVID happened, it became less foregrounded because everything, the theater industry shut down. And when it came back to life, a lot of things were a lot more up in the air. I had a show premiering in Seattle on March 12th, 2020. Mm. So it didn't premiere because right. the, the lockdown was the next day. Yeah. I'd worked on that show for 11 years and the theater had put hundreds of thousands of dollars into it, if not more. And it just closed and the set stayed up on the stage for the wow. next year, you know, and, um, but that's what I trained to do. That's what I have my MFA in. I've won awards for my talent and promise, but I've never quite, uh, I mean, I did, I've, I've had, a sh I've had shows that have had productions in Florida. I had a production of a show, my Kafka inspired show in Denmark in 2017, but I've got a few new shows that I'm just, I just love so much and i'm looking for the moment when you know i'm just trying to keep them keep, keep the the heat on a low lowest setting to keep keep the keep the the soup simmering exactly um a show based on one of my favorite novels the sweet hereafter by russell banks a show about tragedy and transformation um a much more light-hearted show for middle schoolers called middle school mysteries kind of a film noir detective story set uh, in a middle school, but it's also about masks and authenticity and who we pretend to be. And um, that's a part of me that if I could choose one thing, like if I could, if I, if I had to choose only one thing yeah, and thank God I don't. Yeah. Um, that's where I'm at my most unabashedly joyful and my least, you know, music for me just doesn't, it just, turns on a different part of my brain. If I, and if I was to connect with the youngest part of me, mm. which the more I live, the more I long for, that just pure invention and play and creating worlds mm. with words and with music is so important to me. So yeah, that's all I can say about it right now is just kind of give a shout out and thoughts and prayers to my musical theater career and say, I'll see you soon because I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious about it. And yeah. 
And the upside of everything I'm doing is that as I get more of a platform doing these other things and some, you know, some levels of material stability that I haven't had before, that's the artist's dream, right? And then from yeah. there, but it's still going to take a large amount sure. of intention for me because it's comfortable to complain about it and to pine for it and to be nostalgic about it. It's a lot yeah. scary to be like, no, I'm about this now. Sure. I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to make this happen no matter what it takes. So that's active for me. And um, I, th I appreciate you asking about it because I, I like reminding myself that that is um, a kind of uh, missing piece. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing about it. I mean, I think I definitely resonate and relate, right? The multiplicity, the politics, the healing, the psychology, the artist. And the art always takes the back seat, doesn't the it? The art takes the back seat because, I mean, right, we could think about the cultural reasons of why maybe it feels less um, for some, right? There's all these narratives of art being like an extra thing and not necessarily... Um, and the, urgent or necessary. And then there's the personal reasons because it's the most vulnerable. Of course. And the most self-exposed. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, for coming on Hajar's Web. Um, just last question. If folks who are tuning in want to learn more about you, learn more, take a walk with Daniel, book a session, what are the best ways for them to find out? Yeah, for sure. So uh, take a walk with Daniel is at walkwithdaniel.com. Uh, and... There's a new website coming soon, which is very beautiful. The current website is fine too. Um, it works. And yeah, you can book uh, walks of various lengths with me. It is a literal walk. You're walking where you are. I'm walking where I am. And if we happen to be in the same place, then then excellent. And that's for people who want to... That's for people who want to get unstuck. Yeah. And it's a one-time deal. You're not sign signing up for a kind of uh therapy a course of therapy although i am i will soon be offering like m a package of like you know three monthly walks or something sure. like that um so that's that danielmatte.com if you're curious about my musical theater writing and other things like that um lots of interviews and podcasts on youtube in the past few years especially about the myth of the normal and hello again the parent adult child thing uh i have some events coming up in england and ireland in march and Instagram is a pretty good place if you are, for some reason, interested in hearing from me every five minutes. <laughs> Daniel B. Mate, same handle on Twitter. My Twitter persona tends to be a little more ironic and snarky, yeah. but I often, I, there's a lot of cross-pollination. So yeah, those are the places to to, to stay in touch if, if you're so moved. And then if you want to um, register for some of our offerings. Yes, indeed. That's at malchut, M-A-L-C-H-U-T dot one, O-N-E, <laughs> slash offerings. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a couple of cohorts. One is a live Q&A. One is a Jewish healing circle. Um, and one is for anyone who wants to come and do some community healing, psychological orientation work together. Yeah. So thank you so much, Daniel, for being here and um, sharing so much about your story and your perspectives. And um, yeah, and hope that folks will check out some of your work. Thank you so much for having me. As you know, I'm a big fan and it's, uh, it's delightful to be in conversation with you. <laughs>